Lord, get us ready for the word, Lord. We want it to fall on good ground. Give us revelation knowledge. Lord, we ask the Holy Spirit, God, come on in and guide us into every truth that you want us to know. Lord, there are those sitting here. We have different walks, but the same God. And so, Holy Spirit, we give you permission to speak directly to us concerning our walk so we can become better witnesses and better instructors to those who need to hear about you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. all right, well, it's a great honor to have you tonight. It's a great honor to share the word. Now, it is very, very, very important that you understand that I consider it a privilege to be able to share the word with you. As long as I have been sharing the word, it seems to be getting richer and fuller every time. It just seems to have the, all the godly nutrients inside. Amen. And what did God say? Or Paul say? He said, in Christ are all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you and I are in Christ. I always like to do this little illustration. Bo probably can remember from years ago. He said, if you're driving in the car, then you're in the if you're sitting in your house and you're in the, and if you are in Christ and you are, you need to see yourself surrounded by Christ. That your big brother Jesus is literally, you're walking in him, looking out through him. And when it comes time for warfare, you project him and Satan comes front to front with him, not you. All right, so let's get into Romans tonight. Glory to God. Book of Romans, we've been having a good time. I'm going to write, try to get, follow right through that chapter. So the definitions or the easy descriptions of the chapters are in there too. So follow along. Amen. Good to have you to this evening again. So tonight we'll include the chapter of Romans 8, but we're only going to do half of it. Because to do the entire thing, we'd be here two days. Amen. So let's uh, have a review of the key truths leading up to, to this chapter. In chapter one, read along with me. It's about what? What? Yeah, what happens when humans reject God? Now, there's a lot more in there, but look what happened to them. Defilement, debasement. God turned them over to reprobate minds. You see, because they rejected whom? And you take God out of the school? You know, same thing. On chapter 2, here's another one. It talks about the religious people judging others, right? Yet doing the same thing. Remember, they were all still sinners. Because the law couldn't remove sin. It only pointed out sin. Okay? Third tells us the answer to that. For all have come short of the glory of God. Right? Whether you're saved, non-saved, whether you have a background in Christianity or not, if you've never been born again, then we are under sin. It's just an easy thing. We got infected through Adam's fall of a disease that is terminal until the antidote Jesus came along. Can you say amen? And I like to take a shot of Jesus every day and fill my heart with the gospel. Amen. Take my gospel every day. And that's the only thing the Bible says, that the word of God is the only thing is a medicine to all your flesh. Didn't say some of it, all of it. You take a pill for headaches, right? So let's go on. So chapter three, really reality, all of sin comes short of the blood. Chapter four, how is it by believing by faith, it makes a man righteous? Okay, and he uses two illustrations. He uses, what, Abraham before the law and David after the law because it was accounted to them because they had faith in God. So what you got to realize is when we approach God, how do we approach him? In faith. In faith. You never approach God any other way. Cain tried it in works, but Abel's was accepted because he came in faith. Every time we approach God, he hears faith. He rewards those who diligently seek him. What? For without faith, it's impossible to please him. Can you say amen? So we find out in chapter 4 that 
we have to approach God, even Old Testament, by faith. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Now, in, <laughs> good, good job, Seth. In chapter 5, we found out what the problem was. Read along with me. Shows us how sin entered mankind and death by sin and that the free gift of righteousness comes through Jesus Christ and his finished work. Remember, we are two people, an old person and a new creature, a new person. Can you say amen? And the Bible declares that we should be walking in newness of life. Good to see you. Amen. So maybe you could cater to that and get the outlines out, says. Thank. We're on live TV. So, all right. So another thing is, and so, so we go from that. And so again, by one man's sin, sin entered the world and death by sin. All right. Chapter six. Read along with me. We are all dead to sin. How? But alive in God through Jesus Christ. This is what we call the great exchange. God became, made his son become sin, right? 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, Jesus, that we become the righteousness of God. The exchange. He took our sin, gave us his righteousness. Hello. We gave him his, our sin. Lord, don't ever say that we have never gave you anything. And we take his righteousness. But we do it in faith. Can you say amen? amen? When you get up in the morning and you say hello to God, you say it in what? You say it in faith. Amen. Of course it's in love too. Faith worketh by love. But stick to the faith thing, sis. All right. So chapter 6 is, is really that we're dead to sin but alive through Christ. Chapter 7, interesting chapter, wasn't it? Did you like that? Starts off by asking the question, Jews were married to the law. In their mind, if somebody became a Christian, they had a funeral. They committed adultery. So he starts off saying, you know, a woman whose husband is still alive, but she marry another, commits adultery. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. Then he goes right in to the law. Jews become free when they accept Christ. Hello, you're not bound by the law. You can marry Jesus. How many times have you heard Pastor Curry say, don't date Jesus, marry him. You only date him when you're in trouble. He wants to see you all the time. <laughs> Amen? <clears throat> That's right. Hey, God, help me out of this one or not for buggy again, you know. So we were, uh, the Jews were married to the law. Well, when they found that they were freed from the law through Christ, they were free to marry Jesus the Messiah. Paul's defeat, or excuse me, Paul, de, excuse me, Paul, Paul is defeated with his struggles with the flesh. Now, here's what people might not know. Maybe they know that or not. But Paul really was a sincere man, remember? And he was sincerely wrong. But he was a very sincere, heartfelt man. He thought he was serving God when he was persecuting all those Christians. And he thought that he could obtain, now listen, this is how blinding religion is. He actually thought he could obtain salvation by being a good Pharisee. We know that's a fallacy. And we know on his way to being a good Pharisee on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, he fell off his high horse and learned what it truly meant to be a faithful believer in God. And God had to reteach him the scripture. And we see about 13 years of reteaching, you know, um, up in Asia Minor, that he consulted not with a lot of his brethren, right? And then when Galatians, he says, neither was I ordained by any group of men or any one man, but by God. And we know God picked him, right? God picked you too. Amen. You weren't the last on the, the team list. You weren't on the B team. Can you say amen? You were on God's A team, and he loves you dearly. All right, so here's our point. Underneath the point there, see where it says point? 
Now here in chapter 8, we will break it up into two parts. Our freedom in Christ and the victory when walking with him. Remember in the Old Testament, they look towards the coming of Messiah. But in the New Testament, we learn to walk with the Messiah. That's the difference. A lot of Christians and Christians, now I'm, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but we have a tendency to visit the Messiah and not walk with him. Hello? We'll visit him for a short time and then the rest of the week, we just kind of leave him alone. <laughs> Hello? We don't want to do that. Some would say, oh me. Okay, so let's come on. All right, so you and I become a child of God. That's called sonship through Jesus' finished work. Amen? So if he finished the work and sat down, we need to sit down and let him do our work. Can you say amen? We are to come unto him. We are to yoke up to him. We are to learn from him. We are to learn in such a way that the peace of God comes and floods our soul. Hello? And we eventually begin to act and look just like him. I'm going to go out and buy me some sandals, Bo says. <laughs> God bless your heart. So you get the idea. So the last part of that is God is changing you and I into who he has first designed us to be. Do you believe that? And that's champions, folks, full of grace and truth. The law could not do this. All right, so Romans 8. Okay, so you go to Romans 8. Keep your finger there. I'm going to read Galatians for just a minute to set us up. It says under text, Jesus Christ brings freedom from the curse of the law. One of the phrases that a lot of people argue about is the people that say, a lot of people say, well, the law is done away with. No, the law is fulfilled. What's done away with is the curse of the law. The promises of Abraham are still going. Can you say amen? If we be Christ, then we are Abraham's seed. Heirs according to the promise. Joint heirs with Christ. Okay, so here we go. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 through 14 in your text area. It says, for as many as are of the works of the law, trying to get saved by works, are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all the things that are written in the book of the law to do them. Verse 11, But that no one is justified by the law. See, the law couldn't save us. In the sight of God, it's evident. For the just shall live by what? Faith. So when we approach God, it's by Faith. When we say hi to God, it's by. Faith. When we talk about God, it's by. Faith. And when we live, it's by. Faith. That's right. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. So there's something about us knowing God is, believing that he is, and then entering after a period of time, trusting that he will do exactly what he said he would do. You see... The difference is when we were first believers, we believed in God, we acted on faith. But as we walked with him for a while, we settled down into trust. And it's more passively knowing God is in charge. I, that's about one of the best ways I can explain it. Doesn't mean we stop using faith. It means that we're not grunting it out. You know what I mean? We're releasing it. Folks, who lives in you? Whose faith do you really have? Jesus is Christ. So you have your faith and you have his faith. When we walk with him and we're dealing with things that really physically need to change, like a mountain that needs to be removed or there's some kind of thing in the way. He said, didn't he say, if you have faith as a mustard seed, say to this mountain, be thou removed? What he was saying, if you have my faith in you like a seed, it's going to get to a place it develops. You will be able to rip things out by your words. Like cancers. And you say, well, what is really a mountain? Well, metaphorically, or by illustration, a mountain is anything that gets in the way of you and point B where you need to go. 
So it could be a person. It could be a, a broke down automobile. That could be a mountain. How many times have you known a molehill that somebody turned into a mountain? Yeah. Oh, Jesus, we perish. He's asleep in the boat. Listen, Jesus lives in your boat. When you see a storm, trust him. All right, moving right on. See, Romans 8 is so powerful. Okay, so it goes on further to say, um, verse 11, but to no one is justified by the law. Verse 12, yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them or tries to practice the law shall have to live by them. James says, if you break one law, you're guilty of breaking them all, right? So verse 13 says, Christ has, past tense, redeemed, purchased us from the curse of the law. Say amen. amen. Having become a curse for us, as it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, there's a part in here I want you to see, okay? It says that the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for, for cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, right? That the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ. So now you know when Paul says, there's not a Jew anymore. There's not a Gentile. Nor bond, nor free, no woman, nor male, but we are all, as far as God is concerned, by faith, all equal. Can you say amen? amen? Now, see, think about Satan. What have we taught you so far through the last couple of months? How does Satan work? He works by dividing everybody up and putting you in a box. White against black, Democrat against Republican. You know, male against female, Gentile against Jew. Do you see? The idea is we're indifferent. Nothing wrong with that. God made us that way. But Satan has taken it a step further. We get to fighting about it. Now, when we begin to argue now, you guys have been all married. Have you ever had a little what we call intense fellowship with your spouse? No. You'll know that it actually changes the atmosphere around you, doesn't it? That atmosphere change is what Satan feeds on. Now you take that in apple pie at a million, million times and put it in a war. He feeds on it. Another thing you need to know is Satan's always requiring blood sacrifices. What did he do to Cain? He commanded that Cain kill his brother. First blood sacrifice to Satan. Open your eyes. Uh, Hitler was in the occult. He was a double worshiper, but he did it differently. He killed all those Jews as a sacrifice to Satan. Now, you, oh, that's a stretch, Pastor Kerry. Come on, man. There's only two people, oper two deities operating in this earth, Satan and God. And you're right in the middle. Now, the one strongest in your life as a Christian is the one you feed the most. <laughs> if you're in the flesh too much, you're going to be fleshly. It's called a carnal Christian. And if you're going to be in the spirit, you're going to be blessed beyond wildest dreams. Now, you choose. Let's move right on. So, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of law. Say, every curse has been removed. Every curse has been removed. Off of my life. Off of my life. Even, the of Even the curse of generations. Now, remember hearing this teaching that says that the, the, the curse of the fathers will be revisited to the sons? What testament is that? Old Testament. It's a complete lie. Jesus became a curse, and he removed the curse. So the lie is, remember Satan's crafty. He'll have you carry an Old Testament teaching into the New Testament and open it up where something Jesus has closed that door. You just open it up through ignorance. That's why you need to be trained well in the Bible. You need to know why your testaments. You need to know what part you fit. Where is the scripture? Is it dealing with my spirit, my soul, or is it dealing with my flesh? We need to know the history of its setting. We need to know the context of what it says. And we need to know how it applies to me. You get that, and you will be on your way to some wonderful things with God. Say amen, you guys. Amen. 
All right, we love you. All right, so we're in Romans chapter 8. We just started the, I just did some preliminary. Romans 8 verse 1. We are free from sin. Now let me say this, some of you know this. I, I believe that there's some really great Bibles out there, okay? I believe myself, the New King James Bible ministers to my heart. But you're not going to hear me say, this is Bible's not so good. And forget about that. If you can get, if you can learn from a cat in a dog fight and find Jesus, good, God bless you. You know what I mean? But, so, but you'll notice that if you have an NIV or another translation other than a New American Standard, that this is in italics. What it means is, is that the people that translated the Texas or the King James Bible decided to put this in for clarification. It's just as much biblical as it isn't biblical. It's repeated farther down in Romans 8, so it's not lost. But I like the way the King James puts it, because it comes right out and kicks you right in the head. It really gives you reality, because what was the, the cry of seven? Paul says, who will deliver me of this body of sin? Remember, he said in chapter 7, who's going to deliver me? It goes right to verse 1. And what does it say? It says, there is therefore now. When? Now. Where does God live? Now. Tomorrow he'll be in the now. Yesterday he was in the now. What was that phrase several years ago? Are you in the now? Remember that? It was, it was kind of like a hippie phrase or something. You know, maybe, maybe that's beyond us or whatever. But the idea is God dwells in the now. He's so vast and so awesome and so sovereign that he covers everything. Hello. So don't put him in your box of your head. He, he, you know what I mean? He's huge. Amen. And yet very personal. Yeah, Never lose the personal. That's the most important part. So listen to what it says. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The first baptism, born again. Okay? Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So, you know what that says kind of to me? Let me throw it out to you because it's an open Bible study. The people that are Christian who walk in the flesh, do you think they come under condemnation? Yeah. Yeah. All the time. Now, let me ask you, and it's okay to answer this. What's the difference between having a healthy conviction and having condemnation? I mean, the word itself defines it. Condemnation condemns. Doesn't give you any hope. Having a conviction means that God wants you to change that, but he's right there to help you do it. Now, as I say, conviction always points us to Jesus Christ. Good. Condemnation points us away from Jesus with despair. Exactly. That's great. Say it one more time. Conviction points us to Jesus with hope. Condemnation points us away from Jesus with despair. No. Very good. Good. Write that down, everybody. That's a really good one. Thank you. Exactly. Remember who the one gives out the despair. You, yep, you get up in the morning starting to feel you know, a little full of despair. Better talk to the Lord. Of course, all of us here, we train you or we at least try to encourage you. Who do you meet with first thing? And then if you're married, who do you meet second? My girl. Yep, your spouse. Yep. Making sure you're praying. Listen, you don't cover those two first things. You're going to misstep throughout the day. Okay, it's just, it's just common sense. This is not pastor trying to make you feel bad. You, you forgot to pray today. Come on now. <laughs> That's condemnation. All right, so let's go right on. So look, verse 2, for the law of the Spirit. Everyone say law of the Spirit. The law of the Spirit. Has, set has set me free. Of the law of sin and death. That's what happened when you accept Jesus Christ. You went into Jesus who went to court, was convicted, was beat, was whipped, was strapped to a cross, was crucified. When you said, Jesus, come in my heart, you went through all of those steps with him, whether you knew it or not, in an instant of a time, and established 
when the words, it is finished, and given free debt, you have been paid full, paid for in full. Satan has nothing on you, but he will try. Oh, yeah, remember that thing you said last Tuesday? All right, so let's go on past that. I got to get rolling. For the law could not do that it was weak through the flesh, our flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He came in the flesh. On the account of his of sin, he, Christ, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement, you also find that in Colossians, of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who Now listen, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So some Christian who gets up, won't pray, won't read his Bible, has an attitude. We know that's flesh. Now, I'm not trying to condemn anybody. But if they go on in that attitude for a period of time, they're going to get pretty stinky. The enemy's going to pick up on it. Now, folks, the enemy doesn't have your key to your back door. He doesn't watch you 24-7. But sometimes we react in a mannerism over a period of time that does flag him. Like negative talking a lot. Like gossip, maybe. Well, just we use some of these wild things you guys don't do. Or maybe feeling sorry for yourself. You know, some people, will, they got their self on, on mind. In fact, I got this joke. Have you ever heard that, that song? You're so vain, I bet you think this sermon is about you. <laughs> think about it. When you're in the physical flesh part, you're always thinking you're getting picked on. Hello. And if you're in the spirit, and you, you, it could, you could go to a church where they doesn't even preach the word, and you could get ministered to. You see the difference? The idea is don't get up with any length of time in the flesh. Get that over and put it on the altar. You who are spiritual, okay, Take your body and lay it on the altar. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. Amen. <laughs> and keep it there, a living sacrifice. All right, let's move right on. Okay. All right, so he condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement was paid for by Jesus. A couple of points. Okay, I had to turn my page. Number one, we are there. Excuse me. We see that there's no condemnation to those that are in what? Christ. Say, that's me. Who do not walk in the flesh. Have you ever caught, now don't raise your hand. I'm sure you've caught yourself in the flesh. How did you feel? Just fine, Bunky? After a while, you didn't feel pretty good. But have you ever seen a little kid throw themselves down on the floor? In a tantrum? For the moment, they're letting it all out. It's a momentary relief. But then all iniquity breaks loose. <laughs> Amen. So, all right. So the point is, there's no condemnation when we're walking with Christ. It doesn't matter what anybody says anything to you. Why? Because you're God. You're in God's hands. But the moment we start slipping over into the flesh, we kind of set ourselves up. So as Christians, it's of the utmost importance we stay out of the flesh as much as possible. Can I hear an Amen. Two, the law's righteous requirement and penalties were paid for fully by Jesus Christ. Now we get freedom and total coverage in Jesus Christ's mutual life. <laughs> Amen. If I take you out to dinner and pay for all your dinner, you guys shouldn't have to worry about covering any costs, right? If Jesus paid the price for your salvation, why are we running around trying to pay back what we think we owe God. Oh, I forgot to tithe. Not, I'm just joking. Please, if this applies or something, I, I don't mean anything by it. And, and so the person said, but they're a responsible person. I forgot to, so they feel so bad, they're going to make up for it. Well, it's a noble thing. But if they do it just to buy God's favor, then it's lost. Because God, we approach God how? By faith, not by works. Amen. And you guys are good people. You could do some good things. Right? 
but you don't offer that to God instead of Jesus. Amen. When you come to God, you tell him how much you're in love with his son. And because of that, you're in love with him. And that you want to get to know him more and more and more. That he's got to reveal himself to you through his son and through his word. And you're so excited because you certainly want to know more about God. You start praying that. And God will blow your mind. Because that's one of the things he just loves to do. Sit down and tell others about himself. He's the only one that can do it without pride. Right, God? <laughs> Amen. I'm my own best friend. Okay, so, boy, what is it, point three? Okay. The thing to remember is this. Don't let the flesh, the fallen nature in man, run our Christian life. Say amen. We must place God first. By, I say by meeting with him face to face every morning. Just get it. Take care of it. Sit 10, 15 minutes. If nothing else, grab yourself a cup of coffee. This morning, God and I had a little two-ounce steak. Cup of coffee. Some, a big glass of water. And he just started speaking to me, and we started sharing. Now, you say, that's the most unreligious thing I've ever heard. Amen. I'm not a religious man at all. I know him. And when you sit down with God, and he feels comfortable with you, because you're faithful, and you feel comfortable with him, relax. Say, God, please teach me. And then you got the audience. So I don't know how he does it. He can give personal audience to every human being in the world and then other worlds at the same time. He's God. But the fact that he would do that with me and you blows my mind. He's a good, good father. Amen. So, fourthly, we are to lay down our flesh in order to enter into victory every day at the altar of God. God's presence should permeate us every morning and keep us fresh and unhindered. Man is a good illustration. What would they do with the man? They were to collect it every day, right? And they collected it, I don't know, I think, in the morning, in the dew of the morning. You want to collect a little dew with God? Get a little manna? Meet first with him. I don't care if you got Droopy eyes, and your nose is running, your hair's all matted. He loves you. Besides, that part of you is not going to go. <laughs> and the idea is to get on in there. I can't even walk towards where I'm going to sit down with God without his presence just falling on me. And then I began to weep. Now, here's the weirdest thing. I don't, I don't weep because I'm sad. As soon as I say, oh, God, good morning, I start weeping. And I'm going, I want to tell God, these are not tears of sadness. <laughs> he knows that. But what he's doing, I believe what he's doing, he's marinating my heart in his presence. He's marinating my mind. Any hardness of, of the day before or anything, he's just washing, refreshing. I mean, there's nothing like it. Didn't he say, come, taste and see that the Lord is good? Amen? Wow. Do it. Just go in there. Amen. And Peggy went in there. She's never come out. It's been days. <laughs> I can just imagine. All right, let's go on to our next point. Romans 8, 5 through 8. Our mind must be on him. Can you say that? My mind must be on him. Folks, eyes off the world, eyes off of others, eyes off yourself. Put your eyes on the Lord. Why? Because he'll flood your mind with his goodness. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all those oppressed of the devil. God created us for good works. Amen. That we should live and bless others by them. Okay, you ready? Let's go. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind or dwell on the things of the flesh. But those that live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally or flesh-minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and 
Peace goes better with peace. Can you say amen? Seven, because the carnal mind, the flesh mind, is enmity or division against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Do you know why? Nor indeed can be. So then those that are in the flesh cannot please God. So you got somebody comes before the altar and says, Lord, I've been an usher for 40 years. You better bless me. Nothing ever happens to somebody like that. Because again, they're presenting what? Their flesh, their accomplishment, their badges, their stars. They got an A for the handprint in preschool. You know what I mean? And they got it all listed on a wall. And when you meet them, they rip you out all the things they've accomplished. And God's going, oh, what have you done with my son? Now, that's not to say that the good things that we do is good. But you know it's not going to impress God any. Amen. So stop that part. Say, Lord, I know that it's not going to impress you, but I know it does. I believe in you, Lord. And God says, yeah, I like that. Amen. That's not hard. You don't have to build an Isaac temple, you know, right? You got to build four cabins, Alan, before you can be accepted into the brethren of the spirit. I don't even like nails and hammers. You know, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Works of the flesh. So God is not requiring us to do anything but fall in love with his son. And I'll let the Holy Spirit direct us in a great relationship with God. All right, so let's continue to read on. For to be carnal minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because our carnal mind cannot agree with God. So a couple of points. We have five of them. Number one, when we live by our flesh, we fill our mind with the things of the flesh. Like a Polaroid camera takes a picture of what is pointed at. Carnality means flesh rule. The word carnal comes with the word uh, meat. Carnal, carnivorous, meat eater, right? So you can actually say a carnal minded person's a meathead. <laughs> That's an old one. I've had that one for years. Okay. <laughs> Don't be a meathead. What was that? What was the name of that special where the son in law always called. Uh, the father-in-law always called the son-in-law a meathead, you know, whatever that was. Archie, yeah. All right, yeah. Two, placing our minds on things above, only with the help of God working in us, we then will spend time to fill and put our place to receive things. So placing our minds on things above rather than things below. Thirdly, flesh mindedness causes separation from desiring our Lord. People that maybe feel like wounded God or they hurt somebody or were hurt and gotten off out of the spirit into the flesh can almost justify anything. Literally. I know when we lost our first child, Satan just jumped on my head. And he said, why don't you just go out and get drunk? You know? And, you know, I was wrestling hard. Uh, yeah, why not? I lost a child. Blah, 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 blah. Poor me. Poor me. Then I'm going to go and poor me more. <laughs> Instead, I said, Lord, I don't want to do that. And God says, I want you to go see so-and-so. And I knew the kid because he asked sometime when I get up in that area to stop in. It was up in Prairie Ridge where I had all those studies. I stopped in. Well, he had been raped by some men. And he got beat up and left for dead. And he was real bitter by it. And it was really destroying him. So I came in and led him to the Lord. We asked God forgiveness rather than me feeling sorry for myself because I lost a little one. Now, that's an extreme circumstance, I know. But oftentimes, sometimes, facing dirty dishes might stumble you. <laughs> if you're in the flesh... You know, people, I just want to tell you, if you're in the flesh, it, you're just got a little chip there. You're waiting for somebody to go, tick, you know? How you doing? Fine, what do you want? Why are you asking? You know, so that's enough hamming on that. So, okay. Fourthly, okay. But to place God first, oh, so sweet, folks. Putting him in our thinking, 
causes peace in our walk through our life. You see, it's the race set before us is our entire life, folks. That's the race. And you're not in competition with anyone else but your flesh. You are competing with God against the flesh and carnality to win the prize. So don't get entangled in the affairs of this world. Look to the finish, the author and the finisher of your faith, right? Don't stop and say, poor me. Okay, let's go on. And then, fifthly, a fleshly mind is not subject to God and is disrespectful. Have you ever seen somebody really disrespectful? That's what that is, carnality, okay? All right? And is, that's a display to others that I'm an ornery person. Leave me alone. <laughs> no wonder it says it cannot please God. All right, look for this. This is a, a backing up scripture. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace when his mind is stayed on you. So we need to keep our mind on God as best as possible. All right, let's go on to verse 9 through 11. Romans 8. Christ in us gives us life and power. Amen? Now, God gave me an illustration. He always gives me these illustrations. Isn't our God a consuming fire? So let's use that as an illustration. And he lives in our heart now, right? So if you would treat the word of God just as a type, as logs or pellets, you want to feed the word into the fire of God and speaking in the spirit fans the flames so that the fire burns away the chaff in your life and God becomes the first thing in your life and the power of your life. So if you feel like the flame, God never goes out in your heart, believe me. And I'm not one of those that teach what's saved, always say per se. But I certainly believe God's power to keep us is a lot better than fooling around with a, the goober sin, right? Somebody says, well, you're one of those grace preachers. Put me in a box, will you? <laughs> there you go. So you can analyze me. Find something wrong with me, you dumb dumb. No, 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 I do preach grace because Jesus was full of grace and truth. But grace is really the exposure to God too. Listen, if I can get you, because you love God so much, exposed to God, the last thing you'll think about is sinning. Well, they tell, oh yeah, when you teach on grace, you're just going to license people to sin. No, listen, people that are carnal, they don't need any excuse. <laughs> they just go off. So if I preach about grace, that tells them that if they're having a bad time or they got mad at God, grace says, welcome back, son. Put a ring on the finger, a robe around. You see, that's why I preach grace rather than judgment. Why? Because I, when I preach the judgment stuff, which is easy to do as a pastor, you better watch out. As you sow, so shall you reap. I mean, come on, Christians, I tell you what, I mean, they do some of the silliest things in the name of God. Judgment is coming. Blah, blah, blah. Hey, stop reading the Old Testament so much, will you? And start listening to your shepherd. <laughs> I tell you what, you go to prophecy, this is my bandwagon, you go to all these different prophets, none of them agree. Reminds me of the Jews. <laughs> because you, get a, you go to a Jewish synagogue, and they're wonderful, they're wonderful. But then you go four blocks away, and there's another Jewish synagogue, and neither of the one talk to each other. And if you've ever been to the synagogue, they stand up, and what do they do? They argue over the scripture. That, that doesn't sound like church to me. <laughs> Not only that, but God says, don't pray or prophesy with your head covered. And then they put beanies on your head. I think we don't need to follow that bunch. We need to follow Jesus. Can you say amen? I'm just making fun a little bit, not trying to hurt anything, but we don't want to be religious, do we? Do you want to be religious? I don't want to be religious. So let's go on. Let's find out. All right, so Romans 8, verse 9 through 11, but you are not in the flesh. Say amen. Woo, I thought it was. Listen how it's spoken, though. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if 
Indeed, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, what you need to understand about the, new, the, young, the early Christians is they had a revelation of what it meant to be with Christ more than many Christians do today. Hello. They really did. They saw him eat. They saw Jesus sleep. They saw him interact with the people. We believe in faith. We hear about Jesus. We see him by faith. You know, we do all of that kind of, but Jesus was, so, but their disciples knew after Jesus had left, they knew them. That, so Paul could actually make this statement. I mean, this is a bold statement here. Okay. He said, look what he says. This is, this is really something else. He says, he says, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, then you're not in the flesh. But hey, you're sitting there in the flesh, in the spirit. Isn't that a mystery? But he's saying, I don't consider you a fleshly Christian, is what he's saying. I consider you a born-again Christian. Yeah. Now, people say, well, well, if God wanted me to really have all of this he says he wanted me to have, why don't I have it? I don't know. Why have you been complaining all the <laughs> That's why we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, with God. He's got to get the bubbles out. All right, so let's go on. And he said in verse 10, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. So God doesn't want to hear from your flesh. It has sin in it. Even though you're born again and you're crucified with Christ, go ahead and not pray and read your Bible for a week and you will have flesh problems. Hello. We don't want that. I don't know about you. I've been fishing for five days. And all I wanted is a shower. You know? And all everybody else wanted is for me to shower. <laughs> and we can get that way in the spirit, you know? Where we're just, nothing's working right. We need to go and get reset, say amen, in the presence of God. All right, let's continue on. This is cool, folks. Listen, so listen to this, verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he does, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies. In other words, God will send life when you meet with him into your mortal bodies to make it behave. One of the things God showed me, and I, you know, it was a while ago, he told me, showed me when I pray, not only does he amplify our spirit and quiets our mind, but he has some way of shutting down the putrefaction of our flesh. And if you sit there long enough, he'll, just, he'll be just shut it down so it won't affect your day. I don't know how he does it. But it says for us to present our flesh, and then he takes it and he does that with it. So to be crucified with Christ is something you are by faith, but something you do in his presence in the morning. You lay your body down at his feet. If you can imagine that, just lay yourself down at his feet and let God zap you with his presence. Now, put on a garment of praise. Put on his robe of righteousness. So when you're in that time with him in the morning, he covers your flesh with his presence. No longer skins of animals and blood, but his robe of righteousness, his garment of praise, his armor of God, the armor of light, and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh. All right, so, point one. If we have Christ, then we are in the Spirit. Say amen. amen. If we don't listen to our flesh. Two, if Christ be in us, know your body is dead. So don't feed it too much. There is no fruit from dead branches. Can you say amen? amen. But when you... You're alive in the spirit, the new man, you are full of fruit. You're fruity. Amen. Alan's been saying that about you, Tina, for quite some time now. 
Amen. So thirdly, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will give life, will inject life into you, your mortal bodies, by the Spirit. Can you say amen? amen. Folks, stay long enough to get wet. <laughs> you know, I was down there in my prayer closet and I was praying and praying. I didn't hear or feel a thing. You went in to feel and to hear. You didn't go in faith. Amen. See, sometimes it's just a small adjustment like that. Now some people could go to feel and hear in faith. It depends. If you're getting nothing from your prayer time, readjust. <clears throat> All right, you ready? Verse 12 through 17. We are children of God, not bound by our flesh. That's a good one, Pastor Kerry. Listen to verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we're not debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to your flesh, you will die or separate from God. But if by the Spirit you put to death the doings or the deeds of your body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the adult sons and daughters of God. Or are we us or adult sons of God? Now, folks, who lives in you? And if he's guiding you through the day, who's guiding you? God? You are in the most mature state you can be. Because it isn't your maturity. It is God's perfection operating through you. So that's why the scripture says as many as the spirit leads enter into perfection, these are the adult sons of God. Because it's not babies that are led of the spirit. It's adult spiritual people that want to follow the leading because they learn they can't follow their flesh. They've learned they can't follow an unrenewed mind. They learn the only way they can follow God is spirit to spirit. So when they do that and let God control, God is driving the car. You're not going to end up in the ditch. <laughs> so here's the key. There's a lot of good preaching out there, folks. You've heard me say it a lot. They tell you to do this, you've got to do that, this point, this point, this point, and then you'll get the results of what it says. Step one, step two. Step... Sounds great, doesn't it? One thing's missing. Do you know what's missing? God helping you to make the steps. So all these people are hauling out to please God, but they're doing it in their own power. And they'll go for a while and they'll burn right out. How does that happen, Pastor Kerry? Because it went out before God, not with God. And it happens. It's easy. So we want to avoid that. Say avoid it. Okay, so let's go on. So, for as many as are led by the Spirit, they're the adult sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Abba is the most endearing, like Daddy, and Father, most authoritative individual. So you have a father like, like a Daddy, and you have a father that's very authoritative. You are covered. Can you say, I'm sure it means far more than that. And the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's why you can sit in a sermon and it, with a thousand people and the pastor could be preaching and say five or six words and man, your spirit's going zzz, zzz, zzz. That's called the witness inside of you. And that witness inside of you is designed by God to pull out of the word or spoken word or proclaimed word, that which you need for your walk to fulfill God's will in your life. So we can sit under the same sermon and all of us get something different for our personal walk to glorify God in. That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Say yeah! yeah. All right. I got to take a sip of this. Aloe vera juice. All right, so catch this. So don't, you don't have to live in the flesh. So no matter even if you get up in the morning in it, you don't have to dwell in it. Can say amen. 
Two, by meeting with God first thing and laying your flesh down at his altar and be crucified, it's going to make your day good. Three, when we walk with the new man, we enter a mature area of our walk. Why? Because God who lives in us is now in control of our day, ordering our steps. Are you with me? And then fourthly, inside us, God who bears witness to the truth that we are his children and we are not of this world. Yeah. Romans 8, 16 through 22, and we'll break it off there, okay? All right. And that at this life now is nothing compared to God's life for us. Now, folks, you've got a little of the steak on the plate while you wait because God lives in you. But when we get there, what did Jesus say? In my Father's house. You know, he said, don't let your heart be troubled by all this stuff. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Amen? Wow. Ah, I can't wait. It's exciting. Now, just like Mike Warnke would say, I can't wait to take as many people with me as I can. And then he talks about grabbing two sinners at the rapture, you know, and says, do I let, do you get saved or I let go? You know, of course, that's not reality, but it was fun. All right, so let's go on. Our verse, so you got it, 18. For I consider that the sufferings, how many know that you do suffer a little in the flesh? Okay, I'm not saying that there's no suffering. My goodness. But I'm saying suffering is much better when you're really close to Jesus. Okay. For I consider that sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What's going to happen? Well, when God comes to get us and resurrects us, what we have on the inside is going to spin and change our mortal bodies. And we're going to go whizz down if we're not dead first. I mean, if we're alive and remain. Woo! He's going to quicken us. And he says, look, I consider the sufferings of the president. It's not even worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, you know what he's talking about. Anybody want to make a stab? What, God, what did God say to Adam after he listened to the voice of his wife? Cursed be the ground for your sake. For out of it you came and dust you will return by the sweat of your brow. Basically something like that, right? Right? But what did Jesus sweat in the garden? Drops of blood to take away our sweating anguity that when we receive Christ. Now what we might not know, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, that God had the whole entire garden set up to respond to his man, Adam. Why? Because his man, Adam, was filled with God. He was a light creature. And then Eve, when she came along a little afterwards, they both were light creatures before the fall. So they didn't till the ground. They guarded it. They kept it. You know, they kind of straightened things up. But there was no digging in the earth and sweat of the brow and all that. There was no stress. No mess. I like to say that. No stress with Jesus, no mess with Jesus. That is, if you're with Jesus, you're not just hanging out. Amen. And so, by accepting Jesus Christ, doesn't our nature change? So when God said to Adam, cursed be the ground for your sake. He didn't say, I, God, curse the ground because you've been a bad boy. No, cursed be the ground for your sake. What happened? Satan entered into Adam. Where God was, Satan entered in because he ate of the tree, didn't he? Now the ground was, was meant to respond to the God in Adam. Doesn't see or smell or, or, or see Adam, God in Adam at all. Instead, this creature and so yield thorns and thistles to protect itself from man. Now you go study that out. That's as far as I could get without going off the deep end. But I'm convinced that God is not a cursor. He's a, he judges fairly. 
He uses certain things, but you can never accuse God from being unfair. And so, you think about it, our nature has changed. God gave us a kingdom. He said in the Lord's prayer model, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day by day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. What God did, whether we know it or not, is he had reestablished us in a spiritual garden called the kingdom of heaven. Now we need to just speak the word. We don't have to till and work to please God. We just speak in faith. The angels hearken diligently unto the voice of God's word. The kingdom is set up to yield to the sons or the sonships of God. All of creation now is waiting for us to get so filled with God and the change happened. Why? Because they don't want to see and smell Satan on human beings anymore. You want to know why certain animals are flittery and fluttery and they're afraid of humans? I just gave you the answer. Hello. Different nature in us. That's why God doesn't want us fleshing out. And as we get a good dose from the Holy Ghost, can you say amen every morning? There's a lot of stuff here, believe me. And I don't claim to be perfect on all of it, but I want to tell you, God has an absolute res restoration message for us amen. to restore us to our rightful place with him. And there's not a devil in hell that's going to stop that, right? right Amen. Not a devil in hell is going to stop that. Why? Because we're focused, fixed on Jesus. And he's the author of our life. We don't work hard to be good. God, who is good, is on the inside. And we let the goodness out. We speak him. We listen in his behalf. And we use it to discern the truth from a lie. Amen. I don't preach myself happy. Okay. All right. Verse 22 finally says, For we know that the whole world, our whole creation, groans and labors with birth pains together until now. People started changing. Amen. A couple of points, and that's we'll end on this. We have God in us. Amen. Amen. But people, we forget sometimes that he's there. We don't mean to. We just go off and because we have to learn to kind of get that mindset going with us. So we have God in us. And if we allow him to take our life and to lead it, the glory of it is beyond our wildest dreams. Why? Because he's doing everything. He says, step here and you step there. He says, sit down here, sit down there. Now to do something like that's a lot more than just what I said. It becomes a, almost a natural spiritual flow. And we want you to be able, as each individual, to flow that way. To get so nice, uh, and, and I, I hate the word used to God, but comfortable in the realm of God where you're, you're not feeling any fleshly thing hindering you. You can share about anything, you talk about anything. You're open for God to show you things. And that exchange is so rich, there's nothing to be compared with it. And let me encourage you to seek God that way. Amen? All right, so we have God in us. Allow him to take your life and lead it. Two, because of Adam's sin, the whole world is placed under a curse. But you and I have been redeemed from that curse. And we are filled with God's nature. Amen? Amen? So when you hear the term, be filled with the Spirit, it's really Paul acknowledging, don't let your flesh show more than your spirit. In other words, you come to church. How many times have people been offended at church? How sad. And I'll tell you, the only reason they got offended is they were in the flesh when they came. <laughs> they just needed an excuse. So the idea is we don't want to be that way. You could actually... in Pray up and go to a church. Let's say you're on vacation. And you decide you're going to try that church down the corner. You know, 
You don't know what they preach. You went in there, and they don't really preach anything. They just read the news and told you the day is happening and prayed for everybody and sent you out. You get a tremendous amount of stuff, and everybody else is just, yeah, that's pretty good. And you go, whoa, thank you. Why does that happen? Because your spirit will collect what God wants you to know no matter where you're at. If you've prepared your heart to receive from the Lord, you could be in the woods and receive. Can you say amen? Romans chapter 1 says the creation declares him. You could be up in the airplane. You could be down in a mine somewhere looking for gold and have a relationship. You know, there's no limit. The idea, the limitation comes from our physical flesh and unrenewed mind. So that's the first part of Romans, okay? Got any questions? Statements. Okay. So, Father, receive all we learned and our offerings tonight, and we just thank you in Jesus' name. Everyone said... <laughs>